The Lord be with you. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. This Sunday marks the beginning of a new liturgical year with the first Sunday in Advent. This liturgical year B, as it is known, features the gospel according to Mark. And we are grateful this morning to have as our guest preacher Aaron Guzman, the interim chaplain and interim director of religious and spiritual life at the College of Worcester, who will be bringing us a reading, a lectionary reading from the gospel according to Mark. During this season of Advent, we will be featuring families and couples and individuals lighting their Advent wreaths and bringing us the Advent liturgy from their own places of worship. This particular Sunday is also our Pledge Sunday, the start of the stewardship campaign and the pledging of the budget, church budget, for the year 2021. Uh, Many, most of us, all of us, I hope, have received pledge cards in the mail, and you are invited to mail them in uh, to the church office in the weeks to come. Now, normally on Pledge Sunday, during our time of receiving the offering, we would all come forward, and there would be a basket here in the center of the chancel, and we would present our offerings and our pledge cards in the basket, and then have a prayer of dedication. Obviously, we can't do that this year. There is no basket, but I do invite you to pray with me now as we dedicate to the work and ministry and functioning of First Presbyterian Church in the new year. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have come close to each of us. You have extended to us your own special love and given to us such special gifts. Thank you, God, for these. Thank you for all the other gifts that are present in these people who are praying with me today. Together, we are a gifted people. You have given us the gift of our church building for a purpose. It is to be used by us to serve the needs of others. Thank you, God, for the faithful generosity of this congregation. Give us courage and confidence to continue the work we are called to do, so that we may share these gifts of stone and mortar and ministry with all your people in this place, in our community, and in our world. Open our eyes and hearts to those we meet. Help us to see their need and to show your love. Gracious God, we go as your servants, grateful for your generosity to us and ready to touch others with your love. Amen. Let us now prepare our hearts to worship God. Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Stockton Perkins, and I'm here to remind you that there are only two weeks left until December 13th when the fundraiser concert that Scott, my brother, and I put together goes live. We are raising money for Presbyterian Disaster Assistance, and if you make a free will donation, you can secure your ticket to the virtual concert. Thank you so much to everyone who's donated so far, and if you're interested in participating and making a donation, all the information is found in the bulletin and also in Tower Tidings. Thank you so much for your support, and get excited for December 13th. Hello, First Presbyterian Church family. It certainly has been a while since we've seen each other. My name is Wes Davis, and this is our family. There's Nora, and Lillian, and little Oliver, and Sarah, and Eliza is there behind the camera. Thank you, Eliza. When Sarah and I first moved to this community, uh, we were welcomed by her extended family, uh, who's been living in Worcester for generations and generations, and here we are at her grandmother's farmhouse. Um, the thing that we didn't have when we first moved to town was was any place to call a church home, and it took us a while to find uh, First Presbyterian, but when we did, we knew that uh, it, 
could be a church home and a congregation that would help us uh, grow and, and grow in we could grow in faith and, and it would be one that would nurture our family. And we certainly have felt that in the, the more than uh, 10 years that we've been attending. I've enjoyed getting to know many uh, of you in the congregation through my work on faith and practice, nominating, now faith and nurture, uh, and even serving as a session member uh, just beginning this summer. Um, Certainly my kids enjoy Sunday school and all those that they interact with uh, you know, in their early, uh, early years of faith and, and we really appreciate all the work that, that goes into that. Um, the thing that I found uh, most interesting about this congregation is the many talents and, and gifts that, that, you all, that you all have. Um, and I, I continued, want to continue to encourage you to give of your time, your talents, and your gifts to support the work of First Presbyterian Church. Um, and I just want to say thank you to our staff for continuing to provide meaningful worship, worship for all of us, uh, those of you who haven't attended in person, and, and certainly those who are uh, worshiping at home. Uh, we really appreciate all the work that, that has gone into to providing that. Um, we look forward to, to worshiping with you. Uh, again, when it's safe as possible. Thank you so much. Bye. The service music for this first Sunday of Advent comes primarily from one of my favorite composers, Cesar Franck, who was born in Belgium in 1822 and died in Paris in 1890. He spent the bulk of his life at St. Clotilde in Paris and also taught at the Paris Conservatory for many years. These five Noels in the prelude are from a set of 59 pieces that Franck collected very late in his life, uh, which are intended for use by the French harmonium, which is uh, France's equivalent of our reed organ, or parlor organ. It often resided at the front of large uh, French churches and could be used with the choir or for smaller services. In the postlude, uh, Franck pulls together several of the themes from the various Noels and presents them as a sortie, or literally exit music. The musical offering today is an anthem by our choral scholars, Carol of the Advent, or better known as People Look East, arranged by Philip Dietrich. I have Carolyn Rice to thank for introducing this anthem to the choir and to the church in my medical leave three years ago. In uh, an interesting case of it being a small musical world, I happen to know Philip Dietrich from my high school years when he ran a wonderful uh, choral program at Ohio Wesleyan University for high school students. And many of his anthems and choral arrangements have made it into various choir repertoires that I've presented over the years. I hope you have a happy Advent. I can't imagine a year where a turn of the page is more welcome than this one. Thank you.
The power of dreams lies in waking up, for when we close our eyes, we can see a better world. When we close our eyes, we can dream a better dream. But when we open our eyes, we begin the work of faith. So come and worship. Dream your dream and find hope here. Today we light the candle of hope, for hope is the very thing that keeps dreams afloat. May this light be an invitation to keep awake. May this light be our invitation to be Advent people, people who dream. Please pray with us our prayer of confession. Original dreamer, over and over again in scripture, we hear your dream for a beautiful world. We hear your dream for peace and reconciliation. We hear your dream for harmony and togetherness. We hear your dream for community and hope. We hear your dream and yet we do not open our eyes. We continue to live with the curtains drawn, the covers pulled tight, I shut to the realities of the world. Forgive us. Kindle a hope in us that will burn through the darkest nights. Give us the strength and the will to keep awake in this sleeping world. With hope we pray. Amen. Please turn to others around you and offer a gesture of peace. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Hello everybody! Today is our very first Advent Sunday, and each week we're going to share the Christmas story with you in a little bit different way. We want to share the love and joy and hope with you in different ways so that you can experience Advent with us. And so today, Hudson is here with me and we're going to share a story about Gabriel. And he's going to be Gabriel, and we're going to hear how Gabriel affects our Christmas story. This is called The Angel's Secret. Gabriel was an angel. He obeyed God. Sometimes he took special news from God to people on earth. One day, God sent Gabriel to a young lady. Her name was Mary. Gabriel went to Mary. He said, Greetings. God is with you. Mary was afraid. She wondered what he meant, but Gabriel said, do not be afraid. God loves you. He is going to give you a baby. You will name his, him Jesus. He will be God's son. Mary was surprised. How can this be true, she asked. Nothing is pos impossible with God, said Gabriel. I believe you, said Mary. I will do whatever God wants. Then Gabriel left Mary. Hmm. That was an interesting thing. I wonder how Mary felt. She was probably afraid. She was probably scared, and we've all felt scared and afraid. But we know that Jesus comes at the end of this story, and we know that Advent ends on Christmas morning when Jesus is born, bringing us hope and love and joy and peace. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the story, for the angel, for Hudson, and all the other boys and girls out there that are getting ready for Advent getting ready for Jesus' birth. Let us find hope today and throughout this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Mighty God who looked upon chaos and created the universe, loving God who made humankind in your image and who calls us each by name, compassionate God, who loves your creation so much that you became incarnate and lived among us to show us the way to live lives of true meaning and value. We give thanks for your might, your love, your compassion. This is our season of thanksgiving and anticipation, O oh Lord. 
a time to give thanks for the harvests and blessings and lessons of the year, a time to prepare for and to anticipate the birth of Jesus, the baby who will bring bright light back into a dark world. But we confess we find thanksgiving and anticipation to be difficult now. The year has upended itself and us with it. Too often it seems as if darkness surrounds us. Dark days, dark news, dark thoughts. Unheard of loss of life, jobs and paychecks lost, businesses teetering on the brink, lives teetering on the brink. And all of this misery encompassed by relentless partisan politics at home and abroad. Remind us, O oh God of light, that you created that same light in every one of us. Each of us has our own individual ray to help light the path to helping hands, to shelter, to hope, to love. Remind us, O oh God of compassion, that even though everything is about as abnormal as it can be, you have given us the capacity to adjust, to cope, to see differently. Strengthen our coping abilities. Free our hearts from worry. Clear our eyes of doubts. All of this so that we may be ready to see and to shine our light on the new things that you are doing that we don't yet comprehend. Open us to potential, Lord. Remind us, steadfast God, that you are always with us, beside us, behind us, before us, in us. We are never without your presence. All we have to do is knock, and you will answer. Call, and you will be there. Nothing can separate us from you. You created light inside us, O oh God of light. Help us to remember that. Help us to make it shine for everyone. As we once again anticipate the birth of the true light into the world, we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Earth, though ye long have ceased to build, guard the nest that must be filled. Even the hour when wings are frozen, before fledging time has chosen. People look east and sing today, love the bird is on the This morning's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branches become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with its work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or at the cock crow or at the dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This text may seem like a strange one to receive on a first Advent Sunday. Advent begins a new liturgical year and our season of waiting for the arrival of the child called Jesus, in and from whom our hope, salvation, and promises for reconciliation of all things comes. It's supposed to be a season of wonder and joy. It's supposed to be a season of invitations to express love, find harmony, and strive for peace. In a way, Advent is supposed to be a season of all the things that in 2020 
might be incredibly hard to find, feel, and express, at least not in the ways that we've always known. So of course, as the lectionary would have it, we find ourselves encountering this mystifying apocalyptic text through the lens of Advent hope. Now before I go too much further, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge what to me feels like a very large elephant in this physical and virtual room. I, like many of you, I'm sure, have spent the last few months in a deep fog of unknowns, worry, loneliness, anxiety, and numbness. To pretend that those feelings weren't very present when writing this sermon would be disingenuous. Ministers and chaplains and faith leaders feel the same burdens and have the same doubts as everyone else. We just happen to have particular language and lenses that we try to use to make sense of it, but sometimes can't. Therefore, it would be rude and spiritually irresponsible for me to stand here and have the core message of this sermon to be, cheer up friends, just have some hope, without acknowledging the toll that 2020 has taken on all of us. Now, if that is the message you need to hear this morning, it is my genuine and heartfelt prayer that you receive the warmth of this Advent hope fully and completely. If, like me, you are cautious and tired and quite frankly angry at what 2020 has taken from you and the invitation to hope in this moment feels callous and maybe a little offensive, what I do want to offer us this morning is an invitation to being present with our eyes wide open. Let us sit in and with this text and the fullness of our experiences to keep watch as the next things unfold. I spent a lot of time in seminary and undergraduate studying apocalyptic biblical texts as well as works of fiction. What was initially a fascination with trying to understand why so many conservative evangelicals and skeptics try to read these passages as some sort of timetable for calculating when Jesus would return, eventually became a genuine love and respect for the ways in which these texts say something about the world in which they were written and how they also call us to expand our imaginations about what's possible. As a literary genre, apocalypse is often characterized as one of a few different doomsday type scenarios, global catastrophe, disease, war, zombies or other monsters, nuclear holocaust, climate crises and natural disasters, political or economic unrest. How the Greek word, which simply means unveiling or revealing, got co-opted and thrust into this kind of blockbuster movie framework is a discussion we can have at another time. In Mark's world, which was approximately 70 CE, catastrophe and apocalypse was the destruction of the temple, the center of life, tradition, ritual, identity, and ways of knowing and understanding God's relationship with people and creation. You see, the destruction of the temple wasn't just the collapse of a physical space, the collapse of a building. It was the tearing down of a culture, a way of life, a paradigm of understanding and meaning making. Symbolically, at least, this was a sign of the end of things. 
That's the frame of reference for Mark and his audience. When we get to this section of chapter 13, we are entering into a conversation where Jesus and the disciples are wrestling with the foretold destruction of the temple, of impending persecution and suffering under empire, and the return of a very mysterious son of man. It's not exactly the most soothing or comfortable of places to dive in, and especially not in Advent. But then again, is there ever a place in the Gospels that is fully soothing or comfortable? Jesus says to the disciples, after the suffering, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. And he begins to paint this cosmic picture of angels gathering from all corners of heaven and earth. What a bold and perhaps encouraging display of power that divine forces would assemble like the Avengers in response to the pain and heartbreak of an entire group of people. That image would certainly mean something for those who have been victims of military force and violence of many kinds. In the next verses, Jesus speaks of the fig tree and its branches as a sign to his followers of the things to come. As soon as the branches become tender and grow leaves, he says, this will symbolize the nearness of summer and the Son of Man's return. The fig tree, as a character in this story, plays an important role. Not only is it the bearer of nutrient-filled harvest at the end of summer, but as the signifier of this cosmic happening. The fig tree, as opposed to any other tree, is a beacon of change. In Palestine and areas of the Middle East, the fig tree is one of few trees that buds, making it more noticeable among the other trees in the landscape. Unlike the almond tree, for example, fig trees bloom very, very early, and their flowers indicate winter's coming end, the welcoming in of the warmer and fruit-bearing months ahead. The fig tree is the first harbinger of summer, of its bountiful and sweet-tasting harvests, and ultimately, the coming of change. This metaphor would have been very salient to help the, disi the disciples understand Jesus' words, though I can't say for sure if they would have been content in their waiting and watchfulness. There is a very real comfort in this metaphor as well. If you are familiar with growing seasons, you can anticipate when the shifts in growth will occur. You can plan and prepare. You can get your tools out and your gardening gloves. You can make a rough sketch of when you might expect the first yields. And you can try to anticipate how big the bounty will be by the time the harvest concludes. That is, assuming the weather and the other variables follow all best case scenarios. For those of us who are anxious by nature and prefer to have a plan, the notion of being able to see the familiar signs of the seasons changing and adjust accordingly is something that does offer a hint of peace in times of uncertainty. The irony then about what Jesus says next in contrast to the fig tree in verses 28 and 31 is that despite being able to rely upon the steadfastness and predictability of things like sprouting and harvest seasons, there is no guarantee that we will actually know when, what, or if any of this will happen. So just to recap, Jesus spends all of his time talking about the suffering and persecution, the Son of Man's return, and signs of things to come, but then leaves us with, 
But actually, no one really knows. Just be sure to keep watch and stay awake. Y'all, the audacity. Doesn't Jesus know that for people in crisis and those who struggle with anxiety, the least pastoral thing that you could do would be to stir up more unknowns. And the frustrating part is, Jesus is actually right. We don't know the timetable. We don't know when all will be revealed and resolved. Even though it would be nice to have a clear roadmap for the next stretch of the journey ahead, we don't get that from this text or arguably any other text in the biblical canon. Advent is one of my most favorite times of the liturgical year, not because I've always had pleasant memories associated with the lead up to Christmas time, but because I've always been more drawn in to the winding path of the journey rather than being called speedily to the destination itself. Advent, much like the season of Lent, is about preparation and reflection and intentional practice. It's an invitation to recalibrate our understandings of when and where and how and why we are in the world. This very complicated, messy, and hard place where we find ourselves. What's been most difficult for me these past months of the pandemic has not been my workload and caring for students in isolation and quarantine. It hasn't been getting COVID myself or spending all of my time at home away from the people I love and care about. The most difficult part has been the choice to wake up every day and actually practice hope. It's not something that comes naturally to me, despite being a devoted student of theology and of this tradition called Christianity and having elpis, the Greek word for hope, tattooed on the inside of my wrist. Hope is a spiritual discipline. And in 2020, hope has maybe felt like a daunting and tiring task. It feels like every time I've tried to hope, there is always something ready and quick to snatch it away. Sometimes it's heaviness or frustration, sometimes grief and unfulfilled desire. I know this isn't an uncommon experience. Many of us have been in this very same place and dwell there right now. Again, it would be rude and hurtful to pretend that all is now well just because we know Jesus is coming and we finally moved past election day. We are still living in a reality where racism, sexism, homophobia, poverty, ableism, violence, and bloodlust for power during a pandemic are strangling us and those we love to death. And yet, here we are in Advent, the beginning of another cycle, following an ancient story and the rhythms of liturgical life, where there is muscle memory guiding our actions, but at the same time, we are doing something very new. At the end of this chapter, Jesus tells his friends to stay awake and to keep watch. He doesn't instruct them in how to feel during all of this. He doesn't invalidate their fears and grief or worries. The only thing he asks of them is to keep watch, 
to not fall asleep on what's happening, but to remain vigilant, alert, and expectant. I don't think what we're looking for is the fire and brimstone apocalyptic tropes of popular fiction, nor am I fully convinced that the signs of the times will look exactly like what's described here in Mark 13. I do think this text is calling us to think about and reframe hope differently, and that perhaps there are different ways of experiencing and expressing hope in uncertain and turbulent times. Hope is not necessarily a comfortable thing. We can be very reluctant to hope, but still feel it. Despite the odds and expectations, hope can and often does persist. It need not always make sense. Sometimes it even feels like a last resort. But there it is in all of its nuanced, variance, and depth. It comes more easily to some than to others, and it feels more accessible and present at different times. And even though there are so many things and forces and people that try to extinguish it, hope remains. Hope is stubborn. In the face of collapse and despair, Hope still manages to show up when we least expect it. Perhaps that's what Jesus is talking about here. That we have a choice to see and to practice hope. That even when we don't feel it and there are all these reasons not to believe in its power, that if we just stay on the lookout for it a little while longer, eventually it will come. That is, after all, the promise of this season and everything that follows, that eventually hope, joy, peace, and love will shine through the fogginess and illuminate our paths forward to do the work of justice-making. Perhaps I'm making it sound too easy, but I can assure you that it's not. I'm sure the disciples also found this notion difficult and perplexing. But just because something is hard doesn't mean it's not worth it. Just because hope feels far away doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to keep watch and stay alert for its arrival. I think that's why I stick around in this faith tradition, you know? The stubbornness of hope in me and through me. It doesn't mean we don't get tired or angry, but that it's an anchor point as we buoy through this life and its tumultuous seas. We can be cautious and unsure and still dream vividly. That's what hope in Advent offers us. So may this scandal of this hope keep you wide awake this night and every night, watching for its arrival. Amen.
Friends, as we wander into this Advent season together, I invite you to see and practice hope wherever it shows up in your life, whether it comes as tiny droplets or an overwhelming bounty that is obvious. I invite you to keep watch, to know that hope is your anchor when you need it, and that we will get through this time sojourning together. May the peace of God be with all of you as we go out into the world to love justice, practice mercy, and kindness. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.